the rest of the world is to carry on listening. That was Susan Watts. Well, joining me now in the studio is Professor Roger Pilkey, Jr., one of the scientists who attended that private meeting we saw in Susan's piece. He says his work has been misrepresented in an IPCC report. In California is Professor Chris Field, co-chair of the IPPC working group responsible for that report. Uh, Chris Field, good evening. Um, first of all, you took over after this calamitous error, particularly on, on, on the glacier. But do you apologize for it on behalf of the IPCC? That's right. I became co-chair of Working Group 2 of the IPCC in late 2008. Uh, when the IPCC learned that there was a problem with the estimate of the disappearance glade of Himalaya Himalayan glaciers, we looked at it very carefully and came out with a statement uh, indicating that the uh, report was incorrect on that as quickly as we could. Uh, tomorrow morning, though, in the Guardian newspaper, on its front page, your boss... Pachenda Pachari uh, says, I will not say sorry for the glacier error. Will you say sorry? Should he say sorry? The thing that's important to remember about the IPCC assessments is that they're the most ambitious, thorough, and successful science assessments that have ever been undertaken on any issue. Uh, they involve thousands of scientists, uh, more than 2,000 reviewers, uh, more than 90,000 review comments, a massive body of information. Um, we try to strive for a standard of zero mistakes, uh, and we have been overwhelmingly successful, but there are some mistakes that creep in. Uh, we regret those deeply. You do regret those deeply. Um, if I could just uh, come round to Professor Roger Pilkey now. You specialize in the science of disasters, so basically, you know, the increasing economic cost against you know, the, the severity of weather disasters. But you were misrepresented. What happened? What were the, what were the consequences of that? Well, I'm one of the scholars who does fundamental research mm. that the IPCC cites in its reports. Uh, so it was with some surprise I saw in its, its most recent report that it had a graph showing a relationship between increasing temperatures and the increasing cost of damages. That's surprising because there's no evidence in the literature to suggest that that relationship exists. Even more troubling, one of the expert reviewers for the IPCC uh, asked the IPCC to check with me to yeah. see what my views were on this uh, relationship. Uh, the IPCC responded that they thought I had changed my mind on this topic. Um, not only is that untrue, but I was never contacted by I the IPCC. I presume that's professionally damaging, potentially, for you. It's professionally damaging, but more importantly, it's, it's misleading to policymakers. Okay, here we have two things. Now, we have, let's say, the glacier thing. We, it goes from 35 years to nearly 300 years. And we have a misleading information for policymakers and the professor, the specialist here, saying that the IPCC did not take his um, objections seriously. That's two major blunders. You know, the glacier issue is a, is a blunder. The issue with the cost of disasters is much more nuanced, as, as Roger knows. Uh, the, first of all, if you read the section in the report, you'll see that it indicates very clearly that the overwhelming driver of trends and disasters has been the increasing value of assets at risk. And the chapter concludes that there's one study that's indicated that there is a trend uh, through time and that uh, the evidence for that is uh, equivocal, that if you take out Chinese floods or if you take out hurricanes in the United States, but the effect this, goes this away. Is, this is now, the, problem, the goal of I the IPCC which... is to provide a very nuanced, balanced view and the but if thing it's that, wrong, that, if it's the um, wrong view, people need Roger to Pilkey says it's the wrong view, yeah, the, the, that's damaging to policy, for policymakers. The, the problem is, is that if the IPCC uh, the, continues the, to defend the, the indefensible and not allow people to respond, uh, it, it's only going to make things worse. This is not a nuanced topic. There's no ambiguity here. Anyone who takes a look at the literature, at what the IPCC does, it, it, it's not ambiguous. Well, ambi uh, Roger Pilkey, what do you say to the criticism in the film uh, there, that basically the criticism of the IPCC is designed to undermine it? Uh, undermine it? The best defense for the IPCC is to be accurate and to re accurately reflect the scientific literature. There's no better defense than that. Well, Chris, Field, let's talk a little bit more about the accuracy of the IPPC, IPCC reports. Because, again, in this interview in The Guardian tomorrow, uh, uh, Rajendra Pachari also defends the use of grey sources. Now, these are basically newspaper reports, reports from NGOs, which are not subject to peer review. Is that a fundamental flaw in the IPCC's methodology? The IPCC is intended to review in a comprehensive way 
uh, the scientific information that's available on one of the most difficult and important challenges we face, the challenge of climate change. We rely, when we can, on peer-reviewed papers published in scientific journals, but there are many important topics for which uh, the scientific literature in that mode, in the peer-reviewed mode, is incomplete, where reports from governments, sometimes from private companies, sometimes from newspapers, provide additional important information. Uh, when the IPCC cites that information, it has to accept an additional responsibility because the peer review process but you can't provides presume, an important sorry first to step in quality control. Sorry to interrupt, but just so you can't really draw conclusions from newspaper reports or from government reports, particularly, can you? If they're not peer reviewed, the, the the thing that people need to understand is that the IPCC assessment is sort of like a you could think of it as a pyramid. There's a vast amount of information at the foundation, and as we move to higher and higher levels in the pyramid, there's more and more distillation, quality checking, and uh, care in the interpretation so that by the time we come out with final conclusions, which are far from blanket statements but are very targeted and very nuanced, they really have a, a massive amount of okay. quality control associated with them. To, to a late but their person. strength depends on the breadth of this pyramid at the well, base. Well, let's talk about the breadth of the pyramid and public trust because, Roger Pilkey, if you're going to say that something like the IPCC, which is meant to be the gold standard, is going to rely on NGOs, do you have N NG NGO reports and newspapers? Do you have any? Is, is there any surprise to you that the public are now really worried about this? Well, if we were talking about pharmaceuticals or childhood vaccines or even military intelligence, uh, there would be outrage over this. And the best thing for the IPCC to do, which is a very important institution because climate policy matters, is to ensure that it has the public's trust and it's perceived as credible. And this repeated defensiveness, uh, when it's been shown that it makes errors, is not going to help. So should it only be uh, uh, material that's been subjected to peer review should be... Um, with the IPCC's imprimatur? When there is peer-reviewed science, it should rely on the peer-reviewed science. When there's not, it should make absolutely clear that's what it's relying so on. So do you think that the process is so damaged that we need somebody else apart from Pajendri Pajari at the top of the IPCC? I don't know that this is a, an individual problem. I think it's an institutional problem. The Financial Times today recommended an independent audit, which yeah. may be a way back for the IPCC. Well, we've also got today, and coming in tomorrow's papers again, more problems uh, with what we call email gate with UEA. And the problem is, is it not, that the IPCC took as the information for the uh, evidence that global warming started 157 years ago worked by the scientists at the UEA. Do you think it would be better just to scrap that now because it undermines further your credibility? You know, the paper that is in the news today was published in 1990, 20 years ago. There have been many reevaluations of the science in that paper, and the fundamental conclusions have turned out to be very robust. In addition to that, it's important to note that the historical temperature records are based on a, a large number of sources and not just the analysis but of you the would, UEA. But maybe you would say that actually to remove the UEA from the equation would be actually the smart thing to do at the moment. I'm afraid not. We've got a problem here and I'm afraid it's not about climate change, it's about technical change that has uh, failed us at this moment. Thank you very much. I just want to put one final point to you before we finish. Uh, without an independent review, do you think that the IPCC uh, has been uh, really deeply undermined. It has been undermined, and the problem is that there's a lot of very good science that's accurately represented by the IPCC, and many people won't be able to tell the difference between the good and the bad. Thank you very much, and when we finally get a chance to thank him, thank you to Chris Field joining us from California.